Neukirchen, which is what is now Eastern Germany. It's been played in the Chicago Symphony since about 1920, and it's a, a style of instrument that is, is characteristic of this area and a number of other areas in this country of people who admire this type of horn. It has a very centered sound, and it's very resonant, and has a great deal of brilliance to it. Every note has a center, and you can be a little lower the center and a little bit higher the center. In the center of the note is where you're going to get your most pure, most beautiful sound. With Steve's horn, the center is very well defined, so you're going to lock into that gorgeous sound right away. With another horn that's got a huge center, you've got, instead of a V like this, you've got a U. And you might just wallow all around in that center and never really find where the sound is at, at its best. He's state-of-the-art all the way. His whole livelihood is making these horns. And he's dedicated to making the highest quality horn, something that he can be proud to have his name sitting on the belt. I have the finest equipment money can buy, and it has cost me dearly to do that and continues to. Part of it is used in my daily production or my daily work on French horns. Others of it are precision machinery that I turn on just a few times a month, which is very difficult to justify financially, but these other pieces are used for precision tool making. I have to make tools to make the various parts of the horn. Everything has a story around here, and these are, these are true stories. This hammer was made in the labor camps in Siberia in the Second World War by my, my master. His name is Jerry Lechniuk. He was, as I understand, captured and sent to the camps, and he made these, these by hand, these little plant burnishing or planishing hammers. He gave me a great training in restoration of the finest French horns. Most importantly, I think he gave me a pride of craftsmanship. That was important to him, and he conveyed that to me more than any other aspect of what we did. Steve makes almost all of the parts of his horns in his shop. The bells, however, are made in Germany to his design. The bells that on my horns are all detachable. They have this threaded collar right here. Horn players nowadays like to change bells. They like to have bells of, of a thicker or thinner nature, harder or softer, and that changes the characteristics of the horn. Keep in mind, too, that on the French horn, we place our hand here in the bell and the whole horn is then placed close to our body. And by positioning the hand, we can constantly alter the characteristic of the sound. And some composers, like Strauss or Mahler, even ask sometimes for the horn to be raised up in this manner with no hand in the bell and create quite a, a raucous sound. Um, I've taken this horn in as many different settings as there are available to a horn player. I've taken it from playing in an orchestra to playing solos to playing in chamber music settings to um, studio jingles, to just about everything. I'm always making refinements. I'm always asking questions. I'm, I'm looking for a better instrument. But I have to say, the design of the instrument is traditional. And I'm talking about the exterior design of it, the basic specifications, what it's made of, how the valves are laid out. That's a design that's uh, easily 60 years old. Where I've changed this design is in the taper of the inside of the instrument that is responsible for the way the horn works. It has to do with the brilliance of the horn, the resonance of the horn, the projection of it, how easy it is to blow, and all the aspects that a musician is looking for in a fine instrument. And these I have changed. The brass tubing, which becomes the sections of tapered branches, are drawn over mandrels designed by Steve. <laughs> it's filled with a lead alloy because if it weren't filled, it would kink like a soda straw upon bending. It will be placed around this wooden form right here, which is an approximate shape of the horn, as you see it here. 
And I say approximate because every bend is bend slightly different. This bell is different from the next bell, and this bend will be slightly different from the next one. <clears throat> Horns from 50 years ago were egg-shaped. They didn't bother to make these little adjustments for whatever reason, but uh, this one just came out beautifully round. Steve looks to improve upon the instruments built by the old masters while relying on their methods for inspiration. Turn of the century instrument makers, what physics, what acoustics did they really have at their fingertips to use? It was really intuition and observation of earlier instruments. And I operate in the same manner. It's more intuitive, it's more based on my experience. I like to think that the instruments were born in the concert hall and not in the laboratory. The mark I made earlier, and we have just a, a beautiful arc, a beautiful radius. The important part is that the radius be the same from the bell to the tapered branch, and that really looks nice to me. Instrument making is a combination of art, science, engineering, and craftsmanship, and each maker has his own approach. I do what seems right, what seems logical to me, and I'm sure that there are those people out there that are oriented more around the scientific approach to putting these things together, but I put things together with the aesthetics in mind, and it seems like every time I attempt to get a horn together and try to make it more beautiful or more aesthetically pleasing, it seems to play better, and I don't know how that happens. The placement of the valve housing is carefully considered. The height has a lot to do with the hand position, and the hand position has a lot to do with whose hand it is. So I have to keep in mind right now who I'm making this horn for. I've gone through and had this horn fitted to me like a Hong Kong suit. I mean, where my fingers sit above these valves, where this finger hook is placed, where this little flipper is placed exactly fits my hand. One by one, the various tubes which comprise the taper are bent, fitted, and soldered into place. It takes Steve three weeks to build a horn. I suppose if there's any one part of the horn that is more important than the other, the lead pipe is that instrument. After the lead pipe is installed and the instrument adjusted, another Lewis horn will be ready for its debut. I don't know how one would define perfect. I think a perfect horn somehow would be synthetic. Probably a perfect horn is being produced right now on a keyboard with, with sampling and what have you, and you get an ideal, perfect sound. But like anything else, you subtract human influence on an instrument, and you have some sterile representation of a human involved in the art form. That's the important part, that this be a human expression. The perfect horn, I don't know what the perfect horn is. It's, uh, I think it's in someone's imagination. I hope it is. Tennessee River Valley, trumpet maker Clifford Blackburn, with his assistant Tina Erickson, make one instrument a week. For 15 years, Blackburn was a member of the Louisville, Kentucky Symphony Orchestra, performing at night and repairing instruments during the day. I grew up in Knoxville. Bunny, my wife, grew up in Chattanooga. Our family is all in this area. We've loved this area all our lives, and we finally uh, 
come to a point uh, with our business where we could go anywhere we wanted to go, and we decided to come home. Both Bunny and I are Christians, and um, it plays a, a very important part in our lives. We felt that the Lord was leading me into being an instrument maker. We felt him leading us here to Tennessee. I've often said that being an instrument maker is the cross between being a jeweler and a blacksmith. And uh, the science is becoming more and more a part of it. The skill is the part that controls the craftsmanship, the fineness of this instrument. The science helps with the intonation. Putting the two together is simply a matter of taking the dimensions and making them with a great deal of skill and care and um, uh, coming up with a product that is better than what's been done before. So it does produce a very mellow tone. Part of that is the ambrons and the alloy, and, and a lot of it, though, is the, the shape of this part of the bell. It's a very conical shape, very similar to the old uh, turn-of-the-century cornets. Cliff makes every part of the horn. It requires about four hours to shape the bell. Over the years, brass makers have, so to speak, flown by the seat of their pants. Just through experience and trial and error, they've achieved certain amounts of success but only to a limited point. It was only in the last uh, several years with the incoming of the computers and uh, the abilities to do monumental math functions. Quickly have the scientists been able to get more involved in what really goes on inside these instruments. Aside from the design, the metals that we use in the bells are unique to our horns as far as I know. We're using an alloy called ambrons that has a bit of tin in it as opposed to brass, which simply has copper and zinc. This alloy is a little stronger. From the instrument maker's standpoint, it's not so good because it is difficult to work this material. From a player's standpoint, it is superior because at the high volume levels, really holds together well. It doesn't become crass or edgy the way so many of the instruments that we've had in the past have done. I think the most important uh, aspect of Cliff's instruments is the shape of the sound, the, the coloration. When you pick up the instrument, it's an extension of the way you want to play the instrument. But when I pick it up, I feel like it's a part of the way I want to sound. process is metal spinning. This is a forming process, making sure that it's tight against the mandrel. Controlling the thickness of the metal here is also critical. If a player wants a trumpet to be of a darker tone quality or a brighter tone quality, I can have a great effect on what I end up with for that player at this stage of the game right here. A thinner bell will result in a brighter tone, a thicker bell in a darker tone. We can make different bells to go on the same instrument, but that's usually a compromise situation. If they want something that sounds real hot and plays good in the high range, they'll need a whole different weight of instrument, a different setup of bores and that sort of thing for the big band instrument than they would for the orchestra instrument. We have several rather well-known players using our equipment, but we don't, uh, I don't especially like endorsements uh, as a means of, of getting our horns out, simply because we deal with individuals. It's, it's a one-on-one -on -one thing. If we um, uh, tried to sell things according to an endorsement, uh, it, it just kind of goes against the grain for me. 
We're constantly working on things. Uh, we're working on valve designs. Uh, every time we turn around, we're thinking of new ways to do it. Uh, we started out making lead pipes and then hooking the bells to it, and now we're, we're getting the bells so that they're in real good shape, and we're going back and refining lead pipe design. It's a constant effort. Uh, this one, this one came out good. A good player can give you insight and can give you input as far as which directions we need to go. I love working with fine players who can say, pick up the horn and say right away, this is good, this is not so good, and then boy, we can narrow in on a, on a direction and, and come in with something that's really good for that player. I don't want it to get so big that, that we lose control of it, that it just becomes another business. I think that's been the downfall of many trumpet businesses in the past. They get too big, the main goal becomes making more money, and the trumpet players somehow get left out in the cold and get a lesser product than they did before. Jazz trumpeter Wynton Marsalis plays on instruments built by the Chicago trumpet maker David Monet. The Wynton Marsalis Quintet is on a national tour. Here, they're in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, making a sound check before the evening's concert. Get a good shot of that. Say that again. <laughs> she said, thank you very much. Monette is here to show a new piccolo trumpet and mouthpiece to Marsalis for his evaluation. Winton has played on Monette trumpets since 1984. It ought to be okay right now, pretty much all the way down. The first time I worked with Winton Marsalis on the mouthpiece thing, took to it just like that, because he has such a unique ability to analyze what the equipment is making him do that's unnatural. And then at the flip of a switch, Winton also has the ability to forget all of that and do what he has to do to make music. The most important thing about his horns is when he says that he's going to change something in them, it sounds different. Not just some uh, esoteric, that never manifest themselves in the physical realm. As something has been done that makes the horn sound different. That let me know when I first met him that through time as he developed his conception and I worked on his horns, they would just continue to get better and they have done that. It keeps going, he keeps working on different things. His horns keep getting better, they're always in a state of transition. This is a first fitting of the new trumpet and mouthpiece. I'd like to see this kind of rim and cup happen on this kind of shank and stuff. Mm -hmm. So we got the more open sound, because it's a more open mm -hmm. kind of thing. And then the upper register, the mouthpiece needs to be a little shorter, I think, to get the upper register up and in tune, because it's flat. It's a lot harder to play this one, though. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. harder to get a sound out of it. 
The instrument requires changes that Monette will make in his shop in Chicago. Well, I got started making trumpets out of my own frustration as a player with how conventional instruments played and trying to figure out what made the trumpet work and therefore what I could do to make my life and the lives of other people who were trying to play the trumpet for a living easier. One of Monette's newest instruments made its debut in a solo performance by Charles Schluter, first trumpet of the Boston Symphony Orchestra. Really? God, that's what I wanted to hear. What's the story? For whatever it's worth, I even got a favorable review from Tomasini. He says, for once, the proclamatory final tune sounded celestial and sonorous rather than bombastic, brassy, and empty-headed. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's as much of a compliment as you're ever going to get from a Boston yeah. critic. Yeah. Good, so we're flying. I think so. Thanks for everything. Say All hi right. to everybody for okay, me. Okay, we'll do. Talk yeah. to you. Yeah, we bye. spend between 30 and 40 man hours into building every horn. So because we spend so much more time per instrument, we're able to do things that other companies can't. I think the horns are unique in that they are only built when they've been ordered and when someone's been waiting on a waiting list. We build between 15 and 20 horns a month. And we have a list, as you can see, with the names of the customers um, on here for every month. The first four here are going to Japan. The fifth one is going to the principal trumpet of the Budapest Symphony. The Frankfurt uh, Symphony, Dave Tassa. Monet offers a variety of models of trumpets, and most of the instrument is made here. However, the bells are fabricated by another firm to Monet's specifications. While Summer and Blackburn prefer a one-piece bell, Monette's bells are made of two pieces. The limitations of a one-piece bell, though, in my opinion, are that if you think about what it takes to form one piece of metal that has on one end a one-half-inch diameter and on the other end a five-inch, almost five-inch diameter, <clears throat> to get one piece of metal to span such a wide range of uh, finished diameters, you end up having to really spin the uh, flare of the bell out a lot and therefore thin the metal out, making it more inconsistent over the length of the part. And that's a real drawback in musical terms, in my opinion. However, a two-piece bell means an additional seam at the flare, but Monette has a special procedure he maintains will compensate for this additional seam. What we do is, after the part's fabricated, there's a special process that we use to change and optimize the crystalline structure of the brass. And the uh, shape and size and uniformity of these crystals and the bond between the crystals has everything to do with how uh, this part of the instrument resonates. And this process that we do really more than compensates for the fact that there's two pieces of metal. The work I'm doing is based on uh, hopefully just making the most resonant instrument that I can and letting the sound dictate all the details of design and fabrication of parts and all the rest in terms of thicknesses of metal, tempering of metal, the fluid mechanics of the instrument, how the air travels through the instrument as it's being played. All of those things, I think, need to be considered holistically. The lead pipes have... Uh, steps in them, uh, 10 or 11 steps, because uh, we want the metal to be as consistent in thickness as possible, and that makes the instrument more consistent in timbre and resistance from the low register to the high register. As any given valve goes from the up position to the down position, um, as the air uh, changes from one set of ports to another uh, through that particular piston, there's always a downtime where there's just noise and there's no music. But by scraping out the, uh, uh, the pistons and beveling them, that smooths out uh, the airflow as the transition goes uh, from piston up to piston down, and it makes the, especially the legato passages that you play, much more even, much more uh, smooth and fluid. These pistons are really the only shiny part of a Monette trumpet. Dave neither buffs nor lacquers his horns. Brass instruments are brass instruments. They're made out of brass, and that's all they should be made out of. Buffing it takes metal off. Buffing it can also change the temper of the metal. And if you apply an external finish to an instrument after it's been completed, it changes the instrument. It changes the thickness. It changes the amount that the instrument will vibrate relative to the amount of energy being put in the instrument. So we prefer, unless a person has an allergy to touching raw brass, that the instruments be delivered with a raw brass finish. Dave is one of the few custom makers who also builds mouthpieces. 
I make my own mouthpieces because I think that the way conventional mouthpieces are designed and made, they place tremendous limitations on the player and the instrument. And the conventional mouthpieces are not made for uh, any one specific pitch of instrument. In other words, a player will usually use one mouthpiece for many different pitches of instrument, a B flat trumpet, a C trumpet, a D trumpet, etc. And that's crazy. And I think conventional mouthpieces have always been made to be some kind of a compromise, whereas Monette mouthpieces are very different, and either people really love them or they really hate them. They're made for only one pitch of instrument at a time. A C trumpet mouthpiece is a C trumpet mouthpiece and not to be used on any other pitch of horn. B flat trumpet mouthpiece, E flat trumpet mouthpiece, same way. The bottom line is the exact rim contour and the shape of the cup and size of the cup on the mouthpiece is, varies greatly from player to player. It just all depends on how he sets his jaw and the shape of his teeth and the size of his lips. And all that, that belongs to the player. But the rest of the mouthpiece, in terms of how the mouthpiece is balanced acoustically, the ratio of the volume of the cup to the volume of the backbore, the shape of the backbore, the crystalline structure of the brass used in the mouthpiece, uh, the overall length of the mouthpiece, those are all things that need to be considered as part of a package so that the mouthpiece is balanced acoustically for the given pitch of horn that it's designed for. And that's something that, to my knowledge, has never been done before.